testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission. Um, go ahead and turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to uh, go through that entire um, chapter this morning. Uh, if you have your Bible or your scripture journal, if this is your first Sunday here or you haven't had an opportunity to get a scripture journal for us and you would lo- like one, uh, that's our free gift to you. Just raise your hand and we'll have somebody bring one to you. Just keep your hand up if you want one. Uh, we really value the word of God here and we want you to have that in your hands. We would just ask that you bring those Uh, with you each Sunday as you come to worship with us as we study uh, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth together. So last week, uh, we finished up chapter 2 in in our study on 1 Corinthians, and Pastor Daniel did a great job kind of unpacking about 11 or 12 verses there in chapter 2. And if you weren't here last week, I would highly encourage you to go back uh, on our YouTube page and and watch that sermon. Uh, Really, really good, but I'm going to try to at least uh, very quickly sum up a little bit about what he said last week, because Paul, what Paul says in chapter two really is, a, is the groundwork for much of what he talks about in chapter three this morning. And so um, basically kind of Paul was making this, this point. We, we talked in chapter two a lot about this idea of wisdom and this idea of worldly wisdom and spiritual wisdom and what it meant to be wise. We know that uh, in Corinth and Greek culture, that they placed a high value on uh, human philosophy and being able to to identify with different uh, paths of logic and being able to use those both inside the church and outside of the church. And that there were a lot of different competing views and worldviews on how to kind of approach life. And they were making their way into the church and causing divisions inside of the church. And Paul's point last week was, was kind of threefold, but he, he was saying like, if we seek wisdom like the Greeks do as a church, we should be at least seeking it through the spirit of God and his word, not from the world around us. He's saying to them, hey, if you want to be wise, if you want to seek wisdom, the, the way to do that is to go to the creator of the world, not men and women that he created seeking their wisdom, that true wisdom lies within God, not human means. And and that ultimately, if you really want to boil it down and understand the world around you and understand the wisdom of God, you must first know that God reveals wisdom to us. We don't go and find it. We don't discover it And the reason that God does that is so that we don't become pumped up with pride. That God desires that more than anything, that he be worshiped because he is worthy of our worship. And when it comes even to the mysteries of God and knowing him, that God reveals himself to us. And as that revelation occurs, we seek that both through his word and in community, but ultimately through the spirit as God reveals himself to us. And one of the points that Daniel made was that there is no such thing as a Christian who didn't first have God reveal himself to them. And I, I know that theologically that some of us, we don't like that, especially if we grew up, you know, good free will Southern Baptists here in the South. You know, we get really upset about that. But the scripture teaches that God reveals himself. And we can argue over maybe some, some nuance here or there, but you can't deny the language of what Scripture says, that God has revealed himself to us. And whether we made a free choice after that revelation occurred or not, I don't want to get into a debate with you. But I do want to be loyal to the test. And I do want to be loyal to what God says is true about us. And here's why that's good news, by the way. If God revealed himself to you, it means he chose you. And if God chose you, it means it's not up to you. It's up to him. And let me just make this point abundantly clear to everyone here this morning. You want God to be in charge of your salvation, not you. You want God to be the one who secured that for you and gave that to you, not you earning that. And so we we saw that, that Paul says that God reveals wisdom to us. We don't discover it so as to be pumped up with pride. And ultimately, there was kind of this, almost this moment of this like thesis statement that Paul makes towards the end of chapter two so that he can transition then back to this argument of 
the, the fighting that was occurring inside the church. He wants to create this, this idea of, hey, if you understand this truth about God and his wisdom, you'll view disun- disunity and arguments inside the church as something really, really foolish, right? He says that if God is the primary agent of our salvation and all wisdom, then everything, including our lives, are for his glory. Whether you are in ministry, whether uh, whether you're not, whether you're a new believer or you've been a believer for 60 years, right? The truth of God's revelation to us through his son, Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us declares to us all of life is for the glory of God. All of it. And what was happening inside the church at Corinth is at one point in time, they agreed with that. And now they've added things to that. Hey, life is about the glory of God and the teaching of Paul. Life is about the glory of God and the teaching of Apollos. Life is about the glory of God and the teaching of Peter, right? And they were arguing amongst themselves over these different factions and over these different leaders. And so Paul takes this idea of true wisdom, true spiritual wisdom, and builds on it in our text this morning. And if we properly understand where wisdom comes from, the spirit of God, we will not be tempted to break off into the factions that give credit to men over God. We're gonna give God the proper attention. We're gonna give God the proper glory. We're gonna give God the proper worship. And we're gonna be willing to humbly submit ourselves underneath his authority instead of robbing him of his glory like Corinth was doing. And then Paul is going to go on in our text this morning to explain that all ministry, no matter who's leading it, no matter what the church is, no matter what the, the parachurch ministry on campus is, or what the food pantry ministry is, or the homeless ministry, or the overseas ministry, all ministry, even highly successful ministries, are only successful because of the Spirit of God, not the people leading them. And this was something that they needed to hear because they were identifying with men and not with Jesus. And we'll talk about why that should give us great hope and confidence. And then lastly, Paul, and when we get towards the end of chapter three, we're gonna see that Paul does what he always does. He's gonna finish off by encouraging them to rest in the hope and confidence of who they are in Christ because all things have already been revealed to them through Jesus, that they don't need to attach themselves to these worldly leaders in some way, shape, or form that would pull them away from Jesus. And we're gonna see, really, why are we here? Right, when you boil down this entire chapter, we're gonna be able to answer the question of why we are here to glorify God, and we're gonna be able to answer the question of what are we doing as a church? And that's our calling to serve like Jesus served. All right, so look at these first four verses of chapter three with me. He says, but I, brothers, and, and notice how, you know, if you grew up Baptist, you're probably used to that term, you know, being called brother or sister or whatever else. That's just something kind of like culturally do. But whenever Paul uses that term, he's using it to remind them, hey, I'm still treating you guys as believers. You're still in the family of God. Even though I'm gonna spend this entire letter yelling at you for all the things you're doing wrong, you're still a part of the family. You know, it's kind of like that Thanksgiving dinner where it's really uncomfortable because somebody said something they shouldn't, but you still love them, even though, you know, it's crazy Uncle Tim, you know, that, that they're still family. And so he says, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? So some of you guys know my, my oldest son, Gideon. Um, he's, he's 10 years old now. It's hard to believe he's, he's 10 years old, but when he was two, right around the time he was two years old, um, there was this blog that came out on the internet that I was in love with. 
Um, it was on Tumblr. Is Tumblr still a thing, by the way, internet people? I'm getting blank stares. No, apparently not. Okay, so I'm dating myself here. Good. All right, so 2013, there's this blog on Tim Tumblr, and what the guy was doing uh, was basically he had a, a kid about the same age as my son, and any time his kid would have a meltdown, he would take a picture of it and then caption why, why, why his kid was crying. And the name of the blog was Reasons My Kid Is Crying, right? Fair. Right? And, and what he would do is he'd either post pictures of his kid or he would invite other people uh, to post their own examples of why their toddler was crying as well. Now, I know most of you in the room don't have kids yet. As a matter of fact, your parents may have even submitted a picture of you about 10 years ago to this, this blog. I want to share a few of these with you because it's all I could think of this morning while I was, was prepping for my sermon this week. So this one, right? This, kid's cr this uh, kid is crying because his dad wouldn't let him continue to eat the styrofoam football that um, he had been chewing on and eating. Go to, go to the next one for me, will you? So this one, this one's great. Um, he's upset because he doesn't need sunscreen when it's raining outside. So he covered himself in sunscreen. His mom told him, no, you don't need sunscreen. It's raining outside. And so he's having a meltdown about it. And then this last one uh, is my personal favorite. Someone ate all the muffins. It was him. <laughs> and this blog still exists. You can still go find it. They're still posting stuff 10 years later. It's awesome. I love everything about it. He did a book. But the point of the blog was this. Young children are emotional basket cases. <laughs> and we kind of laugh at how crazy they are sometimes. We view their meltdowns about the most seemingly insignificant things as being crazy. You know, like... what. Like, have you ever noticed if you've been around toddlers, if there's two young children in a room, one of them can be playing in the room all by themselves, having a great time, and there's maybe five different toys in there, and there's one toy that kid's ignoring, but the moment another kid comes into the room and starts playing with that toy that wasn't being played with, what does the other child want to do? Run over and play with that toy and fight, right? Right? Like they're marking their territory, get out of here, right? This is, these are what kids do. And then, you know, parents come in, you need to share. And that child's like, <laughs> no, I'm not sharing, right? I own all of this, right? Because they think the universe revolves around them. And they, and they struggle to understand this idea of, hey, you and that other child will have more fun if you play together and share than if you just rob all the glory for yourself, whether you just rob all that time for yourself. And so we look at toddlers and we just kind of laugh at them. Now, parents also get exasperated. And that's kind of the point that Paul is at with the church at Corinth. Because as he's writing this letter to them, look at the language he uses, right? In the first four verses of chapter three, he's basically calling the Corinthians toddlers. He's saying, look, when I first arrived in Corinth and I was preaching the gospel and we were starting the church, I treated you as if you were infants because you were. You were brand new babies. And so I didn't treat you as spiritual people because you were new believers in the faith. And that was to be expected of you, right? No one expects a three-month-old to share their toys because they're, they're a newborn. But while he did that, he fed them with milk, right? He shared the gospel with them. He uh, unveiled things about God and who he was to them. And he taught them and spent 18 months with them so that they would know more about God's love for them and Christ and who they really were. And then he leaves and then he's getting these reports and he's saying, but now I've been gone for some time. I spent all this time with you. I expected, right? What happens to a young child? They grow. And as they grow, they're disciplined and they're taught. And as they're taught, they learn how to do things like share and not melt down because they ate all the muffins, right? They, they learn to kind of grow up and recognize the world around them. And then he's saying, my heart is broken for you guys though, because you've stayed babies. You've had all this time to mature. You were fed spiritual milk. You had people loving on you. You had people discipling you. You had people teaching you about God, and you never moved past it. You continue to act like infants and toddlers, and you should be past this at this point. And, and he knows this is true of them because of the fighting that's occurring amongst them over who their teacher is. 
who their leader is, who their preference is. Because guys, at the end of the day, oftentimes when we start breaking off into these factions or tribes, especially inside of the church, that it's often rooted in celebrity, it's often rooted in preference, not in doctrine or practice. One of my, my best friends years ago, he planted a church in Richmond, Virginia, and then he decided at one point in time that it was time to merge that church with another church in Richmond. And I remember asking him, I was like, Josh, why? Like, how's that going? He's like, well, it, it's, it's, it's good. You know, our people, they love God. He's like, but we've got a real theology of preference amongst a number of people that we're working through. You know, oh, we used to do three songs before the sermon at our old church, and now we're only doing two. God hates us now. And we all have those things, guys. We all have those things that, that, we, that we prefer or we see as preferences. And when we start holding on to them too tightly, this is when this unity, this unity starts. And Paul's basically making this point to them. It's like, guys, I was there with you from the start. Right? I saw you trust Jesus for the first time. I've seen, I've seen you serve your city. I've seen you lead other people to Christ. I've seen you be taught and discipled. It's time to grow up. It's time to grow up now. Just like it is for every human being that's ever walked this earth, and someone had to at some point say to us, it's time to grow, grow up. Some of us heard it when we were eight. Some of us heard it when we were 12. Some of us heard it when we were 20. But it's time to grow up. And when, when we choose as a church, and when we kind of mimic the things we see going on in Corinth and break off into tribes and factions based off celebrity of who our pastor or teacher is or who we want to listen to, what we're really doing to ourselves and to the body of Christ is we are robbing ourselves of the opportunity to experience the joy of unity and fellowship with other followers of Jesus. God created his church to be diverse to have diverse opinions, thoughts, skin pigmentation, socioeconomic backgrounds, worldviews, that the gospel is able to conquer all of those things and bring a level of unity amongst the church that cannot be experienced in any other way on this planet. And when we break off into these factions, we rob ourselves of the opportunity to experience true joy in Christ. Now, I know what some of you guys are gonna do, and so I'm gonna go ahead and anticipate an email or two this week and go ahead and answer something. Yes, there are times when churches should care enough about things where they break off fellowship with somebody. There, there are instances of that. You know, things like denying the deity of Christ is kind of a big deal. Saying Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that's, that's a problem. Denying the Trinity, you know, th those are problematic things. But these weren't the types of things that the church of Corinth was struggling with. They were struggling over, hey, I think Apollos is a more polished speaker than Paul is. So what? That's a preference issue. Oh, well, you know, Apollos isn't Jewish, but Paul and Peter are, so I'm not going to follow Apollos. Okay? Right? There were these things that were causing them to uh, break fellowship that shouldn't actually lead to a break of fellowship. And when those things do occur, right, we run after people and preach the truth to them. We don't run away and break fellowship right away. And that's why Paul's saying here, right, this is so problematic because what happens when we allow preference and celebrity to enter into our thought process of how we're going to operate holistically as, as the church, the body of Christ, is we inhibit growth both inwardly and outwardly. We inhibit growth inwardly because we don't hear di diverse thought and we don't hear the whole counsel of God. And outwardly, we display to the world around us, we can't get along together. We're no different from the world around us. And 
God provides us a better way in Christ. And so, look, I've been a follower of Jesus now for over 15 years. I feel like I'm kind of just now starting to figure some of this out. There are teachers and people I disagree with. Did you know that? Sometimes it's Pastor Daniel. Actually, it's Pastor Daniel a lot. This does not mean I don't have anything to learn from him. I have a lot to learn from him. He's been walking with Jesus longer than I have. And he brings a different perspective to walking with the Lord. And even if I don't agree with him on everything, not only should I not be slandering him and creating disunity, but we press forward in that and learn from one another, ultimately laying down our preferences to make much of Jesus. Why? Because he's my brother who Jesus died for. Or when we reject somebody over these preferential things, what we're basically saying to God is, hey, I know you died and rose again from the grave for that person, but that's not going to be enough for me. This is why when we, when we talk about these things, we say, man, Paul seems to be like blowing this type of stuff out of proportion. Like it's just people not getting along. Like human beings have always done that. And I would agree with that. But ultimately what you're doing in breaking fellowship with the church is you're robbing the power of the cross to bring unity to a place where the world couldn't bring it. And so we fight through that. We fight for maturity. We flee our propensity to become tribal so that we might make much of Jesus together because he's more important than my preferences. And then Paul moves on from calling them toddlers to share with them why it is so silly for them to become overly enamored with a particular teacher or leader in the first place. Because not only do we prove that we're like children, but the, the truth about ministry is that it's designed for God's glory, not for theirs. Right? Look, at, look at verses 5 through 8 with me. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. I see what, see what Paul's doing there? He's saying, look, it's silly for you guys to become overly enamored with my teaching or with Apollos or with Peter or with one of the other teachers because we're all servants at the end of the day. All, our sole job is to do everything our king, Jesus, has given us to do. That's our job. Right? Could, you, could you imagine if last night, right, after the Gators won, everyone in the stands came down and walked over to the water boy. I was like, dude, you did a great job. We're going to follow you from here on out. You guys are kind of laughing. Why? Because that's ludicrous, right? Like, he has a role to play, but I'm pretty sure a lot of other people could play that role too, right? Run out, hand the water to Emory or whoever else needs it on the field, right? We look at the people that are leading, right? The coaches, right? The team, the things that they're doing, right? And we give proper esteem to those that deserve it. And what Paul is saying here, he's saying, look, everything I did when I was in Corinth, everything Apollos has done while he is in Corinth, everything that Peter has done in his writings to you, all of it is done because Jesus told us to love on you and to disciple you. To esteem us to a level higher than Jesus is folly because we do everything for him, right? He uses this illustration there that the church is like a plant, that Paul planted it, Apollos watered it, but God's the one that made it grow. God's the one that's responsible for that. And Paul and Apollos are simply tending to God's field, the church, doing the work that he had asked them to do. 
As Paul is trying to show us two really, really important things right here in this illustration. One, the church is all about Jesus. If it's about anything else other than Jesus, it's got problems. It shouldn't be about the pastor's fame. It shouldn't be about the pastor's TikTok followers. It shouldn't be about the worship team. It shouldn't be about their brand. It shouldn't be about how many people are coming on a Sunday morning or how great things are. No, it should have one mission. Make much of Jesus. That's why the church exists. And the second thing he says that if the church understands that, that they exist solely for the glory of God and to make much of Jesus because of what Jesus has done for the world, the divisions are silly because Paul and Apollos are not at odds with one another. They serve the same master and the same goal. This would be like, if we're going to go back to our football analogy, only supporting the defense but not the offense. If they all work together to try to win the game. They have one task. Right, and Paul says, look, don't, don't esteem me to a level higher than I deserve. Don't esteem Apollos better to a level than he deserves or Peter or any other leader inside of your ministry because ultimately we all serve the same master. See, Paul's giving all of us, right? Most of us are young in here. Paul's giving all of us a lesson on leadership. And he's saying, if you desire to be a great leader, whether it's in business, whether it's in academics, whether it's inside the church, whether it's in your family, no matter where it might be, if you desire to be a great leader, there is one key to success, serve. He's like, do you guys not understand the reason why you love Paul so much or the reason you love Apollo so much or that you love Peter so much is not because of these different things that you might like about them. It's because God is exalting their work because he's serving them and serving you. That's what makes a leader great. And Jesus himself displayed this to us. If you go back to Matthew chapter 20, or look at what Jesus says, starting in verse 25. But Jesus called to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. See what Jesus is saying? He's like, hey, all the great leaders of the world, all they do is enslave the people under them. There's nothing special about them. They just, they just abuse their authority. But then look at what he says in verse 26. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See what Jesus is saying? You want to know the key to leadership, the key to why people are following me around and, doing, and, and, and wanting to follow my ministry and know what's going on? It's because I came to serve. And Paul is simply asking the church at Corinth to mimic their master, Jesus, by serving one another. And church, this is our calling as well. No matter what level of leadership you're in, no matter what you do, if you aspire right, to become a leader, you have to serve. You do. I would encourage you if you're younger to talk to someone older and ask them about some of the great leaders they have in their life. I can almost guarantee you, you will hear a consistent theme from all of them. Yeah, my best boss served with me. One of the best bosses I ever had in my entire life was at Chick-fil-A when I was 15. This guy owned the fourth ever Chick-fil-A in the US. He'd been a part of Chick-fil-A before like we even knew what a chicken sandwich was. And that guy would show up at the busiest times at our store and work the front line with us and then come back and help clean with us afterwards. I'm like, here's the deal. Working fast food sucks. It's not a fun job. Like, no, like, unless you're like a little kid and like you desire to work at McDonald's or something like that, like I did when I was two, 
Most of us aren't aspiring to a full-time career in fast food because it's a hard job. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of pressure. And yet that guy was one of the best bosses I ever had, not because of how much he paid me, not because he was some eloquent speaker, not because of all these different leadership characteristics. It's because he was a servant. And he served with us. And so when you got, had to clean out the fryer or deal with the angry customer who didn't get enough fries, you weren't quite as upset because you're like, hey, the boss is in on it with me. Here's the beautiful thing about being a follower of Jesus. We're just mimicking him. Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he himself did not do first. And one of the things he says to be his followers is that we would take up our cross and follow him. Why? Because he already took up his cross. Why? Because he already submitted to the Father to the point of death, death on a cross. Like that is why Jesus is worth following. And Paul cries out to us, just follow our king, guys. Don't make this about me. Don't make this about Apollos. Make it about Jesus. So after service today, we're going to have a great opportunity for some of you guys to start putting some of this into practice. Right? There's all sorts of different ministry areas in our church that need more people serving in them. Go up and talk to one of them over here on this wall after the service and get plugged in. Serve. Right? Don't just come and consume, but serve. And I promise you that God will bless it the same way he was blessing the ministries of Paul and Apollos. Because that is how God operates. Because marks of true leadership inside the church, but really in any organization, is, that, is, is, is what Paul shares here in these verses, right? In verses five through nine, he says that marks of true leadership inside the church are one, that leaders know their role, their servants. In verses 10 through 12, he says they know what their job is, to build on the, the foundation of the gospel. Right? Paul says, if anyone builds on any other foundation that they failed, but that if if you want to follow a church leader and a pastor that, that is doing God's work, they should be building on the foundation of the gospel. And then the third thing he says in verses 12 through 15, that they lead with grace and humility, knowing that their work will be tested. Guys, I've been a Christian long enough to see a lot of ministries grow into mega churches and then literally crumble overnight because of poor leadership. And we always like want to dissect what happens, like, oh, that leader failed or that worship leader failed or whatever else. And we always want to dissect these things and like ask why. Paul shares with us why in verses 12 through 15. He says, hey, if a ministry is not built upon the gospel, God will put it through fire and put it to the test. And if it goes through the fire and is not built on the gospel, guess what happens to that ministry? It fails. God will not share his glory with any man or woman. He will not. And any ministry built upon any other foundation than the gospel of Jesus Christ and making much of him will not stand the test of time. This is why I've had people be like, you guys talk about the gospel and Jesus all the time. You guys say, yes. Is there a problem? Well, don't you like want to do like all these other things? Nope, want to talk about Jesus. What about all this other stuff? What does Jesus say about that? It's all about him. It's all about him. And we, and we will not apologize for doing so. And so, he starts off the chapter by calling them toddlers. Thanks, Paul. And then he moves into pointing out the fallacy of falling into these tribes over these different leaders because ultimately they're servants. And then ultimately, here's how he finishes up in verses 16 through 20. He's going to encourage them to know who they really are. Now look at verses 16 through 20. Do you not know that you are God's temple? and that God's spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. 
Christian, read those words again this morning. If you are a follower of Jesus this morning, read those words. You are God's temple, and his spirit dwells in you. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. See the encouragement he's giving them? You are God's temple. The Spirit of God dwells in you. He's a seal of your salvation, protecting you until the day of Christ Jesus. He's given you spiritual gifts so you might serve him in his church. He gives you teachers and leaders so that you might grow and be discipled into Christ. Why? Because you matter to God. This is the great thing about reading a chapter like this. Paul starts out the chapter calling them toddlers, and then he tells them how much he loves them and how valuable they are to God at the end. The same way an exasperated parent looks at their crazy toddler and still loves them because they matter to them. That's how God views us, guys. He looks at our immaturity. He sees the foolishness of disunity inside of this church. He says, guys, stop fighting. Stop arguing amongst one another. I've given you my spirit. Dwell in me. And the implications of that truth are are earth-shattering, guys. The God of the universe cares for you. The creator of the cosmos cares about you. You're not just some some accident of primordial soup evolving. And I don't want to get into the implications of macroevolution or not. But whatever happened, God did it. And he cares for you. You matter to him. And guess what else? He cares about the people that we create disunity amongst and the ones we fight with and the ones that we are tribal against. Republicans in the room this morning. God loves some Democrats. Did you know that? Democrats in here this morning. God loves Republicans. If you're like me and you're a libertarian because you hate everything, God loves everyone else too. So much so, that he gave the life of his only son to rescue us. And to break unity in the body of Christ is to attempt to destroy God's temple, his church, to bring shame upon his name. And Paul says, guys, don't, there's no need to fight. There's no need to break fellowship and unity. Embrace your identity in Christ and pursue maturity. Now, the question that inevitably comes with that every time as we hear the hope that is in that is how? How do I do that? Let me read verses 21 through 23 for you again. So let no one boast in men, and look at this, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, that's Peter, or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's. And Christ is God's. See what he's saying to us? We already have everything we need in Christ. Do you guys know that one day Christ is going to return and he will rule and reign 
over not just the United States, not just over North America, not just over the earth, but he will rule over the entire universe. And we are his. We are, his, we are part of his family. And what is his is ours. I mean, we don't need some special revelation from some person who claims to know something that everyone else missed as if the apostles didn't know enough about God. What Paul's actually doing here when he shares this with them, when he says to them, for all things are yours, is he's actually pushing back on Stoic philosophy. And if you know anything about Stoic philosophy, here's kind of what the Stoics believed. They believed that everything in life was either positive or negative emotions. And the whole goal of life was to try to reduce negative emotions as much as possible and help individuals hone in their virtue or their character. Sound familiar, by the way? There's an awful lot of that being offered in the world. Now, I don't know about you guys, I haven't seen a ton of success in that. Because ultimately, what Stoic philosophy is built on is that you are your own God and you can achieve something greater than what you currently are. And ultimately, you will reach that on your own. And God's word destroys that because he will not share his throne and he will not share his glory except through Christ. And if we are found in him, and as Paul says here, you've already been given all things. I mean, think about the things that are wrapped up in being in Christ. Forgiveness, hope, peace, true peace, I'm not talking about like a lack of war. I'm talking about peace of knowing what you are supposed to be and be becoming. Some of you freshmen would love to know that information. Love. An inheritance. All of that is promised to us in Christ. Not in Stoic philosophy, not in the wisdom of the world, not in money, not in celebrity, but in Jesus. Church, God loves us, not because we are lovely, but because Jesus is lovely. And because he's lovely and because he loves us, he's available to us to go to him, to confess and repent of sin, to experience the forgiveness and hope and peace and love that only he offers, to experience the joy of the Holy Spirit, his presence, his guidance, his wisdom, his gifts, and all God calls us to do is to enjoy that and respond to the hope that he gave us in Christ, to respond to what is already true of us, to believe upon the name of Jesus and to worship and make it all about him a testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the gospel in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life.